Hey ladies, I am here, Coach Jean Clemens, with another one. I have the lovely Carita Parks here. Um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having you me. You know, Florida's in the building, by the <laughs> yes. way. If you ain't know, Florida Duval is in County. the build. Duval. <laughs> Shout out to Hillsborough County, Tampa Boy. You know how we do. Um, it's it's been a spectacle. You've been here at, at, at um, Super Bowl Media Week since yeah. since Monday. Yes. Um, I, I saw you at the, um, the, the the opening day media day where there was crazy amounts of people and fans. I don't even know how I feel about the 20,000 fans in there while you're trying to get interviews. It's a little odd because they're just sitting there watching. Yeah, they can't hear you. <laughs> it's like, it was yeah, just, it's it an was, odd situation. Yeah. And they can't even hear the players really, I, exactly. I don't think so. Exactly. So I thought that was interesting. But, um, you, you've been you've been doing this, and now like um, covering the covering the, the the Baltimore Ravens this year. I think it was your first year covering the Ravens. First right? year covering the Ravens. Prior to that, I had covered the Commanders yep. four seasons. Yep. And so like Ravens versus what you've been dealing with the, with the Commanders <laughs> on the field, obviously has been a little bit different. Very different. Um, in in the five years that five years right that you've been covering five specifically, years covering like, team. specific teams. Uh, been covering the NFL in general since 2015. Yeah, yeah. So what's the difference that you see from covering an individual team versus having to have a, a more, you know, full view of the NFL? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge difference right there, right? Because if you're covering the NFL, you have to have more of a full view. When you're covering an individual team, you like you still have to have that lens on what's going on but your focus is really that team and getting to know those players and their stories. And so you're just really wrapped up in the individual team that you're covering. So you lose a little bit of what's happening big picture wise because your focus is just, you know, so singular mm -hmm. during the season. Yeah. Do you find that you'll see a national story and try to find like an angle that fits into your specific team or do you just like kind of at some point you're you're almost blocking out the national stuff in, in order to kind of stay focused in on it depends on what the national story is right so it, there does have to be for me a natural link linkage between what's going on nationally but what I find is for the most part you are really focused you kind of are blocking out you have an awareness of what's going on on a national level but like I said, you're so wrapped up in that team, especially for me, first season covering the Ravens. Yeah. Like my focus was getting to know these players, understanding what their story is, how, you know, how they have played over the couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it was really lear a lot of learning that I had to do this yep. particular season. So I would say for me, that really blocked out a lot of the national stories. Unless I had time to like hit back and relax. Yeah. Um, now, when you talk about Lamar Jackson, nationally, there's a lot of narratives. Mm -hmm. So I hear that, especially if it's involving a Ravens player, definitely paying attention to that. Um, so next season, I may be able to, you know, balance the two better. But this year, it was like I'm going all in Ravens. So I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. Absolutely. <laughs> the well, two things. Number one, how bummed are you? How bummed are this, you? I know where this is going. Okay. That the Ravens did not make it. Like, how how much more epic would this week have been if you were able to cover the hometown team? I mean, that would have been, like you said, epic. It would have been the perfect situation. You know, I've covered Super Bowls with different teams, but to have the team that you cover at the Super Bowl, yep. those guys that you've been building a relationship with the entire season actually here. I mean, that would have been, especially my first season, of yeah. fire. Yeah, fire. Like, like they talk about Taylor Swift winning a, a championship in her first season. Yeah. You not win it first. Exactly. Come on, I was like, come on, come on, come on. Uh, um, I do think it's interesting, though, because if the Ravens would have made it, which I believe they should have. They should have. I think that's the part that makes it tougher though yeah is because and i'm not saying this because i cover the team uh -huh. but in seeing how this team that team played throughout the season and then i said in my opinion they did not play their game for sure in that afc championship and that that's what made that loss i think 
tougher. Yeah. Just knowing that they didn't play their game. If they went out, didn't win, and they were playing their style of ball, totally different story. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think for a lot of people who thought that the Ravens is going to were going to were going to win, it's not the fact that they didn't win. It's how they didn't win. You know, right. It's, it's how, because it's hard for me even to just say that they they got beat. They it's, didn't. A, it's hard for me to say they that. I know that's that. disrespectful to, to Kansas City, but they don't care about what we're talking about. <laughs> it, it just, to me, they had that game. It was, it was, it was a Ravens type of game. Only the, the only Kansas City was playing. Yeah, like Kansas City was playing. Kansas City, Pacheco had twenty something rushes, and I'm like. That, that's the that's the blueprint that the Ravens have used all year to bludgeon people with, and they didn't do it. So I know as somebody that's covered them intimately, yeah. like the entire year had to be frustrating for you to watch it unfold and like, yo, know, how do I? I mean, that was the question of the question after that game. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you run the ball more? Because not only is that a huge part of their game, like you mentioned, I mean, Kansas City, I believe they're like the fourth worst team in the league mm -hmm. when it comes to defending the rush. So why yeah. not? It, it was like yeah. they were playing to Kansas City's strengths in that game. And I will give it to the defense. They came out, were not on their P's and Q's, but they adjusted at halftime. And I think that's the other part is that the defense was able to shut out Kansas City in that second half. They did not score a point. But the Ravens' offense just could not get anything going, could not get any points on the board. And and the and and I look at it too. It's 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 partly that, and it's partly like just some bad, unfortunate things that happened. Like yeah. I don't I don't actually think the defense played. I don't think they played poorly in the first half. If you look at the amount of points that were scored all all together, the the thing that they did, they they weren't able to get off the field on third down in the first half. Mm -hmm. And in the second half, they were able to get off the field on third down. But the the swing, to me, the swing is you don't score, you don't score when you're when you're right down there on the goal line when 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 you know um, Zay Flowers fumbles the ball. We we teach our guys this in, 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 in all the time. Like there, the goal line is not where you reach the ball out. That's not where it is. And if you look the way the play unfolded, he didn't even really need to dive. He could have yeah. just, like, sped his way in and, and took a hit and got in. That's an unfortunate, but that cost a touchdown. And then subsequently that next drive where yeah. Lamar throws the interception, which in hindsight we see Isaiah likely get taken down. Nobody, no, no, no flag, no nothing. But I argue that if the touchdown happened, before that, then the play calling is different down there, mm -hmm. and the decision of Lamar to possibly force that ball is different. They were so, pressing it. They were. Yeah. I mean, in both of those situations, by that time, they were trying to make something happen, uh -huh. and the patience wasn't there. And I feel like if the patience was there, those some of those decisions wouldn't have been made. Yeah, but on to on to better things. Right? Because I could rant about this. No, no, I don't. Want, I don't want you to, to feel like you have to like yell at the other people about the, the Ravens. Although we, I think the culture is disappointing. Right? Yeah. It's not just as much as we love Patrick Mahomes. Right? As much as we love Patrick Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes represents you know everything that's that's great about black quarterbacks in this space. Lamar Jackson is. Is, is is the culture. And and I say that because a guy like Lamar Jackson, he when we when you listen to him, he sounds like your cousin. Right? <laughs> yeah. You listen to him, he sounds like your cousin. He's not trying to fit into any box. He's not trying to fit into any cookie cutter. He is genuinely one hundred percent him yes. and comfortable with it. Um one of the things that I was telling Michael Penix, you know, with the do rag, like, yo, rock your do rag. Like, don't let somebody tell you, oh, well, this is how you've got to get to a certain right. whatever, change up your image. Because that, to me, that was a lot of a knock on Lamar. Before this season, people were questioning things that were all made up off of stereotypical 
you know, things and not anything off based off of what they've seen him do. Right. Even down to the fact that when he was when he was drafted, everyone made it seem as if he was this like read option quarterback. And then you go and you look at his film in college and this dude was sitting in the pocket, drop back, you know what I'm saying, yeah. short passes and then hits you over the top and when the, and when the play broke down. That's where he did, and so it's, it's it's been refreshing this year to see that. Exactly, you know, He's kind and of going back to yeah, no, game. it's no disrespect to Greg Roman, but I felt like Greg Roman couldn't get out of his own way. Like you had so much success with doing it this way that you almost stifled the growth of a quarterback that never wanted to play that way. Like and he he does not want newsflash, people. Lamar Jackson does not want to run. He does it because he can. He does it because he has to. He would rather sit back there and pick you apart all yeah. day. Like, if you can't tell that by now, it, I would love for one year for him to get the same amount of pass attempts mm -hmm. as a Patrick Mahomes, as a Justin Herbert, as a, as a Josh Allen, and people tell me that he's not on the same level. Because if you look at his attempts, he, he's a couple hundred from what these other quarterbacks I mean, I just are. think it's interesting that people want him to prove himself as a quarterback based on what they deem makes a great quarterback. Yeah. I mean, Lamar Jackson is who he is. And like you said, I mean, we saw it more this year where you could tell that he was deciding when the run mm -hmm. versus just, just running. And I will say, I will give it to um, Todd Monkin. Like you saw more of who Lamar Jackson is as a quarterback, um, with him as the offensive coordinator. Surprising but, too, because <laughs> Todd Monken has some some checkered history with understanding how to like really and fully employ a quarterback that has multiple talents. So, well, you know, we'll see what year two brings. <laughs> but year one was good. We, Very I mean, good. Shout Lamar, out to Todd Lamar Jackson's back to that MVP. Mm -hmm. In the MVP race, so yeah. You've been in. You've been on the. You've been on the, the media side. You are on the public relations side. Yes. Tell me some of the differences between the two, because when I was in college, as a journalist, as a journalism major, the public re we didn't really rock with the public relations people like that. They were a little. Uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't well, say it could be this, all fish, but they, they just didn't they didn't feel like they wanted to well that's funny right because being on both sides i can see sometimes i'm just like oh some of these pr people are so unprofessional because i am because i have a pr background yeah. right so i could pick up on that on the pr side Dealing with the journalists can be frustrating sometimes because you're not getting, either you're not getting responses or sometimes PR people want a story to go a certain way yeah. and a journalist is going to write the story based on what, what they, they want to write. Yeah. So it can be a little bit of a push-pull. So it's kind of funny on one side, like, Right, the PR folks can be get frustrated with the media folks, and the media folks can get frustrated with the PR people. But at the end of the day, we need each other, so Absolutely. we have to find a happy medium. Yeah, yeah. I I think the most interesting part about a, a PR job is spin, right? Because that doesn't exist. Well, it shouldn't exist on on the on the on the on the, on the media side, on the journalism. Well, I'll side. say that's a piece of it is spinning. But then I also feel like a piece of it is being proactive so that there doesn't have to be spinning and preparing whomever you're working with, whether it's an athlete, a business, a CEO or whatever, preparing them for what's to come to avoid a situation where you have to spin. That's that's fair. So you, you feel like the whole the, the fixing is a product of, of the lack of preparation. A lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at the end of the day, you can't control everything that happens. Yep. And so that is a huge part of the job is being reactive. But in a lot of cases, preparing, being proactive goes a long way to avoid some of those situations. Yeah. When you're dealing with people, it can be a little bit more difficult because people are people. 
and once they're not with you, they do they do, they do they people want. things. It's <laughs> like when mom and dad are going, right, okay, now right. I'm going to show out. So, you know. What's, speaking of that, what's the one, the one thing, the one mistake that you see most athletes make when it, in terms of their public persona or just what people see, like how they how they're perceived with all of this, um, with all of this availability of yeah. you know exposure and being able to get your exposure off yourself. You don't need the media anymore as much. Like, what is the yeah. one thing you see people make a mistake? With? I mean, I think for me, what I see is, especially because we are in the social media age, I don't think that athletes always understand that you are still a brand. You you have a personal brand. You don't have to be perfect. Part of social media is being personable, but you still have to be responsible because some of the things that you put out there, some of the things that you do, it can be, it's documented. And we've seen on many cases where what someone does on social media comes back to haunt them in the sport that they play or where they work, because this goes beyond athletes. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like social media use is sometimes, and not even just what's posted as far as like videos and such, but even just tweeting and, and, and saying whatever, going at someone, um, like a GM or something, whatever, uh -huh. or just saying irresponsible things. It's like you still have to think. I understand that you don't feel like you have to be responsible on these platforms, but you do. And you have to realize that sometimes that that, that social media persona that you put out there, whether you like it or not, it doesn't always work in your favor. That's so, fair. I think I think yeah. going live is the. Is the, I mean, is all of that going live, hosting, like, hosting videos, not thinking about what you're posting. I mean, it's a, it's a ton of things. Yeah. But I will also say, from my perspective, with some of these younger athletes, I don't know if they are always, and this goes back to what I was talking about with the preparation, like being prepared to talk to media and it's a lot i will say it's a lot because it's every single day and some of some people are asking you questions that are out of this world or yeah. you know trying to trying to trap you so i can yeah. understand it but sometimes there's and this is not with the organization i cover <laughs> remember i've been covering the the nfl or sports in general since 2015 but it's the it's just elaboration like these sometimes these like very short answers they where you're not really saying saying anything I, I just don't I'm like you don't have to give a minute answer but answer the question yeah you know I think one of the things that I've seen and you can tell you can correct me if I'm wrong because you're more of an expert in this but my entire point whenever I interview with somebody whenever they, they want me on is to make them want me back again right and that doesn't happen with the short answer. No. Like when they feel like they have to drive the conversation, they don't want you back. And I think one of the biggest places that um, athletes, especially in this space, where they make the mistake is, is they don't look at every interview as the opportunity to promote themselves as someone that people want to hear from, mm -hmm. right? I've had conversations Especially in football, like that. Yeah. where you're wearing a helmet, and we don't we don't know you from Adam without the helmet on, yeah. unless you're one of them ones, you know. But another trend that I've seen is, you know, and and I don't know where this comes from, and maybe it's just because it feels a part of the job talking to media. But I'm just like, you know, if if someone if a reporter does a good story on you, yeah. Re shout retweet it, shout them out, shout yeah. them out, like it, something. Yeah. But I see a lot of these guys. It's I don't know if they understand the importance of the importance of media and how that can help shape your reputation. Yeah. That's why I said I think, and I see it more on the with the younger athletes, which all of these leagues are becoming younger and younger. I don't feel like there's an appreciation for how media, like I said, can put you in a positive light. You think that's a, 
that's a um that's that's causality because they have a, a phone in front of them that they can do a lot of that themselves they feel like they can do a lot of that themselves i actually think it's just a lack of education honestly when it comes to just educating these athletes on how media can be valuable to you like if, if you meet a good reporter build that relationship because they can they'll continue to write good stories about you yeah. now i get it the ones who are always the reporters that are spinning things writing negative stories i understand that one yeah. but when i don't think it's being able to do it themselves because i see it with guys who really aren't as flashy on social media i see it from both sides um so i just think it's a lack of media literacy <laughs> sometimes well no I, and I don't and i'm not saying that like, no but, it's, but it's, not, it's the but. truth because i try to talk to um my players about hey you need to be you need to be quotable Yes. It doesn't mean you have to say something outlandish. It means that you have to say something of substance yeah. that people want to come back to you for another quote. Like if they don't want to come back to you for another quote, then guess what? You're not going to get them pushing your whatever it is. I also I also thought about this, and I've had this conversation with a bunch of friends of mine that are in the business. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that especially especially our black athletes start reaching out to people who look like them and have their best interest at heart yeah. not meaning that we're going to like protect you from, from some dumb stuff like if you do right. something crazy but like just to tell your story the way that your story mm -hmm. i've seen so many of these people run to these entities that are that are popular only because they run to them right yeah, and I but I also think that for whatever reason, it's automatically these larger outlets, these outlets that are not run by people of color, are automatically seen as more reputable. Oh yeah, for sure. And personally, I don't personally care for that. On the PR side, I've told clients before, you know, sometimes it's these smaller outlets that are going to do the better stories on you. But automatically, you know, people value what's bigger or what they deem to be bigger. Like the, I think, I think my my issue, and, and I, I've heard other creatives talk about it in other spaces, especially in music. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about it a lot. Like the culture is what brings the the notoriety to to most platforms. When the culture gets involved, that is usually when you see. The up the, the heavy uptick, right? Mm -hmm. And so if if you you kept the main thing, the main thing and said, hey, listen, instead of a X journalist, I'm going to go to a Y journalist because I know that the culture is going to be represented there. It, it helps to not only boost you because you're going to have a story that really speaks to what you want to say and what you have to bring to the table, but you're also going to uplift that. That, that outlet that probably needs to have. I, I mean, I'm not over I here. I mean, I absolutely agree. Yeah, I'm not over here with a with a with a million, you know, with a million subs. So like, if I was to if I was to get the love, you know, like you coming, anybody that's willing to come mm -hmm. that that represents what we represent, I'm gonna make sure I, I try to put them in the best light possible. And I think that a lot of athletes are missing out on that. A lot of a lot of a lot of artists are doing it too because you see them running like in the, yeah. the podcast space they're running the toby off out off because they automatically i think that the thing that's very important is understanding i mean who who is your audience because just because it is a big platform that doesn't mean it's going to reach the people that you want to reach so being strategic is also important but nobody's being strategic these days nope. Um, they're going for the. They're going for whoever's getting the hits. Like I, like, like sit. Like you seeing people sit down with a with a Kai Sinat, and I, I really, I really like dig like what he's tried to do, right? And so he's he, he he's had a great year, and then Killer Mike wins the Grammys, and he says out of his mouth, "I don't even know who this dude is." It's like, like, like even if you didn't know. That's not the move. Yeah. Like, like you, 
especially with a platform like his where you got millions upon millions of people watching, you kick this man's back in because because Drake didn't win another Grammy? Like or because or because um Astro not Astro World, what was the name Travis of Travis Scott? What was the name of Travis Scott's new album? Oh, that I, I can't forget. remember. Utopia. <laughs> Utopia. Okay. Utopia didn't win and I'm like you know what, this may not be the time for you youngins. This is but that'll time. probably backfire because now people are probably looking up like they might not know who it is and now they're looking it up. So Yeah, well it might it might end up. But being, it reflects bad it, on it Killer looks Mike. Bad. But it could yeah, work it, out. <laughs> you know, because people are saying his name. And yeah. I guess anytime someone's saying your name, it's not an awful thing unless they're attaching it to something ungodly, right? right. But um what I what I do know is that when we look out for each other, everybody prospers, right? Exactly. Everybody prospers. And, and I, I, is it the same thing that you would say in sports, being being a woman in sports, and not only just being a woman, but being a black woman in, in sports media, is there is there a lot of camaraderie between the women in sports media, or do you find it to be because it's, it's such a smaller, demographic that people are really just kind of fighting fighting it out to find their own little position it's a little bit of both i think that and i mean this can go beyond just the sports world but i think it's a little bit of both i think you find your people Mm -hmm. and those people rock with you they support you but then they're still outside of that there's still competition because like you said it's a very small space especially for women but then shrinks even more when it's black women. Absolutely. So everyone's fighting for their spot to be the one that's seen, etc. So it's a little bit of both. I found my people. I was about to ask, do you have? Because I have a, I have a group. Yes. Like, I have a group of guys, all in the industry, all doing their thing. We're all, and we, it's like there's no competition between us. It's we see what the other person does and we love it. So now we want to try to continue to stack on it. Any type of door we open, we try to shovel the other dudes in. Do you have a group like that? I do. And it's the same thing. It's a small group of people, Mm -hmm. but I do. And that's what I said. I'm here this week with Louis TV. Mm -hmm. Met the president, Candy. Met her through my work with the Wizards and when I covered the commanders. And so then when she became president of this TV station, she was like, hey, you know, I would, I, you're talented. I would love to bring you in. You know, as a woman, she could have been like, eh, you know, I, yeah. you, I want this all the shine, but she wasn't like that. Absolutely. And those are the people you have to find. And I'm fine if it's one or two people, mm-hmm. but when you find the people that support you, that's just the way to go. Yeah, so you're, you know, being a woman, Covering, covering the, the Ravens, covering Washington, covering um, NFL, but then also covering NBA as well. The WNBA. Yeah, well, W. You don't want to get me get me started <laughs> on the W now. Um, but being in those spaces where you're just surrounded by dudes. Yes. And and quite honestly. It's rounded by dudes. It ain't even the most impressive dudes. Let's be real about it. <laughs> no like, comment. Media is filled. We are filled with a bunch of either unathletic looking <laughs> or out of shape looking dudes. Okay. That will that will have the audacity to tell you that you don't belong in these spaces when they look like they've never thrown a football, shot a basketball, caught a baseball. Like, do you ever just stop and go, the audacity of you? Like, <laughs> like, have you looked in the mirror lately? Well, you know, for me, I'm the type of person where when I go in these spaces, I'm not walking in there like I don't belong. Like, you can't tell me I don't belong. Yeah. You will never tell me I don't belong. So I go in there, I'm on my business. I make friends. Like, I'm not, you know. Yeah. But I feel like for me, what I have found is I make sure I ask quality questions. That, for me, if I don't feel like I have a I don't feel the need to ask a question. I don't have to ask a question every time I'm in front of an athlete or at a press conference. I ask a lot of questions. If you 
you know, see me on social media, but at the end of the day, I feel like I've built respect when I'm in those spaces, because I'm sure they're looking like, who, who is this, who yeah. is she, where she come from? But I feel like I've built respect over time by the quality of questions that I ask. And I think that they can see that a player respects me based off of what I've asked or how I've interacted with them. So for me, like I said, you will never be able to tell me I don't belong. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad because you do belong and <laughs> you are you. great at what you do. Appreciate it. Um, I have loved watching your your movement over the years. Um, quality work, always willing to be boots on the soil. Yes. You know, there's a lot of people that come to to the Super Bowl week, that and is you true. don't see them at any of true. the functions that you would think that media members should be at. But you see them a lot of social things. So, like, I always appreciate because I know I'm going to see you like in the trenches. Yeah. In the um, trenches. Tell everybody where they can find you, where they can see your work at, where they can follow you at. Okay, well, you can follow me on all social media platforms at Carita C. Parks. Also, I'm the CEO of Double Take Sports as my own sports media company, so you can follow that at DBL Take Sports on all social media platforms. And as always, you know where you find your boy at, at Gene Clemens. Shout out to Say Less Sports Tees who have made this all possible, allow me to be here this week. Um, big shout out to um, Cycle Bar Midtown Savannah for everything they do. I'm at 500 and something. I'm feeling a little shaky. I haven't ridden. I haven't cycled in like four days, and I'm okay. feeling the I'm feeling the the urge to get back <laughs> on a bike. I'll be back. I'll be back on Sunday. So y'all um, definitely you know check me out there. Come and come and hang out. Come get your sweat on. It's a heart healthy month. And so we're really, you know, um, I think month, um, January was like a dry January, right? That's what they dry said. Dry January, yes. So now we're trying to get heart healthy in February because I missed dry January. Oh. I, 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 didn't, I didn't partake in that, but heart health, I'm all about. Um, as always, hey ladies, we got her right here. Until next time, I'm Coach Gene Clements. Peace.